on, that, uh, on the time of that first Palm Sunday, there were two parades that entered into Jerusalem. The first parade entered in on the west side of town. And at the center of that parade was Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate was uh, the ruler um, representing the Roman government over Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. And Pilate had been spending some time in his home at Caesarea by the sea, uh, a very beautiful, kind of tropical, uh, wonderful place to be. No surprise that he would want to be there. But the Passover was coming. And as you may know, the Passover celebration is one uh, where thousands, that would draw thousands of people of the Jewish faith into the city of Jerusalem. And one of the purposes of the Passover celebration was to remember how God had freed the Israelites from the bondage of slavery when they were being oppressed by the Egyptians. And so the story of Passover, the celebration of Passover, the festival of Passover was about how God had delivered God's people from oppression and toward new freedom in the promised land. There was a prophecy that a Messiah would come and that this Messiah would once again lead the Israelite people, the Jewish people of faith out of any oppression that they were experiencing and into a new freedom, into another promised land separating them from those who had rule over them. Pontius Pilate knew about that prophecy. He knew about that hope. And he was afraid that as all of these Jewish people came into Jerusalem to celebrate one of their most holy festivals, that they would have a mind to rebel, that they would rise up, and that they would uh, strike out against the Roman government. And so Pilate comes from Caesarea by the sea and travels about 60 or 70 miles to Jerusalem, bringing with him thousands of heavily armed troops. And as they get to Jerusalem, they enter through the western gate, Pilate at the center of the parade with a massive show of force surrounding him. This was meant to bring pride into the hearts of the Roman people. And it was meant to bring fear into the hearts of the Israelite people. This was a parade where somebody important was sending a frightening message. On the other side of town, the east side of town, just outside of Jerusalem in the towns of Bethany and Bethphage, Jesus had been ministering to the people there. And as the day of that first Palm Sunday neared, as, as, they, as they approached Jerusalem, Jesus sent some disciples into Jerusalem to bring back to him a colt, a young animal that had never been ridden by anyone before. So they went in and they got the animal and they brought the animal back to Jesus and then they took some cloaks and they laid the cloaks on the animal's back. Jesus sat down on the animal and as they began to journey into Jerusalem, they, they laid some more cloaks on the ground so that as they walked, they were not, the animal wasn't on the ground but was walking along on top of cloaks that would be moved and laid continually in front of him. There were surely people who saw this parade, but nowhere near the number that had witnessed the other parade. This was a lot smaller, a lot more humble. Um, and for people who weren't a part of the Jewish faith, it might not have made much sense to them. They might have just passed it off as folly. But for people of the Jewish faith, when they saw this happening, they recalled the stories of their faith ancestors and how victorious kings would return back to the people after winning a battle. Humble, riding on the back of an animal with cloaks on the ground, leading the way. For the Jewish people, when they saw Jesus entering Jerusalem um, in this way, what they knew was that he was making a clear statement. I am a victorious king, and I am riding triumphant into the holy city. And so some of them took some palm branches as Jesus entered into the city, and they waved them, and they shouted, Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the son of David. 
two very different parades. If you asked people who were there at that time if they had seen a parade, many of them would have said, oh yeah, I saw that parade. How could you miss it? It was unbelievable. Such a show of force. Such a show of power. It was, it was stirring in its might and in its majesty. And then there were others, far fewer in number, But if you ask them if they saw a parade, they said, yeah, we did. It was a small parade. And there was a man riding in on the back of an animal. And there were people welcoming with with branches of palm. And and they were shouting Hosanna. And along with him, there were 12 men. and, And there were some very faithful women. It was kind of a ragamuffin group. But yeah, I saw that parade. Two parades. One with a somebody at the center. The other, with a rabbi from a nobody town entering into the city in a way that not many people saw. Of course, we know that just a few days after the entry into Jerusalem, Jesus is going to be crucified. He's going to be put to death in the most nobody of manners. When I talk about crucifixion as a death reserved for the nobodies of society, uh, it's kind of an understatement. Crucifixion was not only excruciating, it was not only painful, um, it was humiliating. And it was meant, in as much as it was, to cause pain, to cause humiliation. And those who were crucified, before they were placed upon the cross, they were stripped of their clothing, so they hung there without clothes. They were often tortured, whipped, and beaten to the point that they were disfigured. And then they were placed upon these crosses. Some of them were tied to the crosses. Some of them were nailed to the crosses in the way that Jesus was. And then the crosses were lifted up so that they would hang on them until they breathed their last. Now, I know that some depictions of the crucifixion show the crosses way up high, giant structures. That that was not the way it was done. Actually, the crosses were quite small. Uh, The feet of the crucified would have been about this level. Um, This was very close up, and it was very personal. People weren't watching this just from afar. It was often set up along a roadside or somewhere where people could walk right by those who were being crucified as they died. They were close enough to the victims' faces that they could strike them, which people often did. They could spit on them, and they could hurl insults at the dying. On the day that Jesus was crucified, he and two other men along with him had been stripped of their clothes. They had been beaten, and they had been forced to carry at least a portion of the cross on which they would die, to a place called Golgotha, the place of the skull. And when they got there, they were nailed to those crosses, and the crosses were elevated and raised up before the people who had gathered. And as they were gathered there, watching the men die, they began to taunt them, to hurl insults at them, and they were close to them as they did so. Soon enough, their attention turned toward Jesus. Hanging above him was a sign that said, the king of the Jews. And they began to mock him as a false king. And they began to cry out to him, if you really are the Savior, if you really are the Son of God, then come down from that cross and save yourself. They teased him with the very chants that that escorted him into the city originally. Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Sure, you're the son of David. Hosanna in the highest. As if. The mocking would continue for quite some time. And and at some point, according to the story of the gospel, um, one of the thieves that was beside Jesus, he joined in the mocking. Let me say just a little bit about these thieves. The the, the word that's in our scripture is either thief or criminal. But actually, the Greek word is one that was made up of two very distinct and very descriptive words. 
The first word um, meant sinister, evil. The second word meant the worker of, to do the work of. So as these words came together, in the original language, it didn't mean simply thief or criminal. It meant the worker of evil, the worker of sinister things. The people who were crucified were absolute nobodies. They were seen as the worst of society, the, the, the bottom of society. They weren't anywhere near the level of those we might call decent people. They were absolute nobodies. And there they were, hanging on the cross next to Jesus, and one of these workers of evil begins to join in the mocking and turns to Jesus and says, if you really were the Son of God, then save us. Get down off the cross and save us. We're dying. On the other side of Jesus was another evildoer, and he saw what was going on, and and honestly, I, I have a little sympathy for the person who was lashing out at Jesus because he was afraid. He was hurt. He was in pain. He was humiliated. He knew he was, he was dying. And often when we're hurt and when we're wounded, that, that's when we lash out. So, so I'm hesitant to judge the other one for doing so. But, but here's, here's this other evildoer on this side of Jesus, and, and, and he turns to, the, to his counterpart on the other side and says, Stop. You and I, we deserve to be here. We are guilty of our crimes. But he is not. He's, he's innocent. And then this evildoer, this worker of sinister things, turns to Jesus and says to him, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus turns to him and says, truly, I tell you, this day you will join me in paradise. If there was ever a moment in any gospel that demonstrates the power and the amazing grace of Jesus Christ for the least of these, the nobodies, the outcasts, the forgotten, the condemned. This is that moment. The evildoer standing, uh, being crucified next to Jesus, had, he'd, he'd never been baptized. He never made a formal confession of faith. He doesn't even make one there on the cross. He'd never said the the sinner's prayer that people often say is required for salvation. He just turned to Jesus and he asked Jesus to be remembered. And Jesus promises him that that day he'll not only be remembered, he'll be in God's kingdom, he'll be in paradise. So deep runs the grace of God that even for one such such as these, there's hope. And there's life to be found. What strikes me perhaps the most in this story is the request. I want you to imagine being at the very end of your life, knowing that your life is coming to a close, and with your last breath, your request is just to be remembered. That's it. That tells you something of the kind of nobody that person really was. A person who people had looked at and walked by and seen and immediately forgotten, a person after whom he had breathed his last on the cross would surely be forgotten. When people were crucified on the cross, they were often left there for days, continuing the humiliation. Then they might be taken down from the cross and and put in a mass grave filled with nobodies as a final sign of how worthless they were in the eyes of society, completely forgotten, not even a tombstone to say, here lies. Can you imagine being in that place where you are so alone that the only thing you can think to ask is for one person, just one person in all the world, to remember you?
this moment of grace leads me to ask just a couple of questions. Questions that I've been asking myself in preparation for today and, and questions that I want to encourage you um, to think about as, as we move through this experience of Holy Week. These are difficult questions and they may create some discomfort, not in the moment that I ask them, but in the moments that we take them seriously and seek to answer them over the course of the next several days. The, the first thing that I want to talk about, the first question that I want to ask you, is that if Christ's grace is enough, that he would not only remember the evildoer, the sinister one next to him, but would offer him a place in heaven, a place in paradise, if Christ's grace is that, is that vast that it could forgive him, is not the grace of Christ enough to forgive us? To forgive me and to forgive you. Maybe our sins haven't risen to the level of those who are crucified on either side of Jesus Christ, um, but Lord knows that you and I have done some shameful things. Lord knows that there are things that you and I would rather have the opportunity to go back and change and since we can't change it, we'd just as soon not think about it or talk about it. And we surely don't want other people to know about it. Things that we've said or not said. Things that we've done or not done. Things that we did on purpose and things that we did by accident. Things that we knew were wrong and things that we still know are wrong. And things that we're worried that if someone really knew that about us, we may be someone that they no longer see as somebody, but instead as a nobody, worthy of just forgetting. What does it look like for you and I to just be honest about those things? First with ourself, then with God, maybe with one another, I'm not preaching at you, I'm standing with you because there are shameful things in my life. There are things I need forgiveness for that I can't even think about because they're, they're things I wish didn't exist, but they do and I know it. And I need to be freed from the burden of them. You know, a few weeks ago in, in her sermon, Julie talked about the nature of church and, and what church is supposed to be. You know, church isn't a place where all the perfect people come. Church is a hospital. It's a healing place where the broken among us stumble in. Not to be recognized for our holiness, but to be received in our brokenness so that we can find healing and life through the grace of Jesus Christ. That's what this place is about. There's no shame here. There's no need to be embarrassed. There's nothing, nothing that you could have ever done that will permanently separate you from the love and the grace that can be found in Jesus Christ. And as the sinful person on the cross, the, the person on the cross turning to Jesus and asking to be remembered, just a sliver of faith is enough to be made whole and to be given life. The, the thing that I want to invite you to do is to just this week spend some time confessing sin to God. And if there's something going on in your life, if there's something that it isn't enough just to talk to God about and you need to talk to someone else, um, I want you to know that we're here for you. Your staff is here for you. Your elders are here for you. And, 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 and listen, we're just here to walk alongside you. You will not be judged. You will not be condemned. Your story will not be shared. But we want you to know that we love you just as you are and that God's with you just as you are. The second thing that I want to invite you to think about and the second question that I want to invite you to answer is, is there someone in your life that you need to forgive? Is there something in your life that someone has done to you that, that you need to let go of? Um, in, in, in our prayer that we prayed this morning that Jesus taught us to pray, we say to God, forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Um, God didn't teach us that prayer in order that we might be part of some divine quid pro quo 
That if we don't forgive, we won't be forgiven. It's a reminder that just as we are forgiven, we are called to forgive other people. I wonder if there's someone in your life that you need to forgive, whether they know you've done so or not. I recognize how difficult this is. I'm not talking about excusing someone else's behaviors. I'm not talking about forgetting. I'm not talking about letting go. Because sometimes the things that we need to forgive are not things that we can let go of because they've got hold of us. And their grip is tight. It's not about any of that stuff. It's about trying to find life. And again, just as there are sins that I've committed in my life that I need to be forgiven of, there are people in my life who have sinned against me that I need to forgive. Sometimes I've been able to do that. But there's a couple cases where I haven't been yet. Because it's hard. It's easier said than done. And for whatever reason, I haven't been able to get there. And if you haven't been able to get there, I get it. I get it. But this is what I also understand. In the places where I have been able to get there, I've been able to experience the letting go of resentment and anger and bitterness and wrath and things that I still hold on to toward those that I haven't been able to forgive. Those things that kind of eat at you from the inside. Those things that make you not even want to think about the person or the event or what's going on that make us dig in our heels because we just can't get there yet. I get it. But you know, when Jesus forgives us for our sins, we're promised eternal life. And what Jesus teaches us about forgiving others is that when we do that, we begin to find new life and abundant life right here and now. Is there someone that you need to forgive? After Jesus took his last breath, they took his body down from the cross. And they didn't put it in a mass grave with no names and where the nobodies were left. They put him in a new, unused tomb of a man named Joseph of Arimathea. This was the most somebody of ways to be buried in a tomb that nobody had ever been in before. And they took Jesus down from the cross and they carried him into the tomb and they laid him down And the day was drawing to a close, and so they shut the tomb before they had the chance to prepare the body for final resting. When the tomb was closed, all the people who were gathered around watching the events, including the disciples from afar, they thought the story was over. They thought darkness had won. They thought that the one they believed to be Messiah had failed because he had died and had not freed them. Even the ones closest to him were so convinced that the story had ended, they ran away and locked themselves for fear behind closed doors. They were terrified. They didn't know that Sunday was coming. They thought that everything had ended then. In a few days, of course, we're going to celebrate how we know the story ends. But before we get there, We need to sit at the foot of the cross. We need to recognize the grace that takes place there. And we need to let its shadow fall upon us and our sins. And we need to let its shadow fall freely upon those who have sinned against us. I can't wait to gather with you next Sunday to come into this place to look into the tomb and see that he is no longer there because he is risen. But before we can do that, we've got to journey faithfully through these final days. My prayer for each of us is that we will do so with intention and with hope. Amen.